So, Sonia, I'd, I'd like to start with, a, with a, a background question, maybe something you might not share on the main stage. Um, how did you develop your interest in this topic in the first place? Um, that's a great question. So it was really serendipitous. When I um, started graduate school, my advisor, this was at Stanford in 1989, uh, my advisor, whose name is Lee Ross, um, is, was one of the world's experts on conflict and negotiation which is, seems like it has nothing to do with well-being or happiness, and it doesn't really. Um, and then the very first day we met, I don't know how it happened, we started talking about, like, what is happiness? And what is the secret to happiness? And this, again, this was 89. There's really only one person in the world who was studying happiness then in academia. That's Ed Diener. Uh, and he's wonderful. But, um, and he didn't even call it happiness. He called it subjective well-being which he told me he did that because he thought he couldn't get tenure if he was studying something as fuzzy and unscientific as happiness. Mm -hmm. So he just created that word, and that word cer certainly has stuck. Anyway, so that's how it started. And the, our first studies where we were just interviewing people who were really happy and not so happy just to kind of get it, like get it a window about, uh, of what it's like to be a happy person. Um, that comment about tenure hits home. One of my colleagues at, at Northwestern is a neuroscientist at the, at the business school, and, and we were discussing a uh, similar topic about 10 years ago or so. If you were in neuroscience and studying free will, uh, people wouldn't touch you. That's different today, just 10 years later. So Things have so changed, actually, in many fields. Um, what, what's yeah. changed in your field most markedly in the past decade? Right, in the so? science of well-being, just the, the research has exploded. And not just in my field, which is experimental social psychology, but in neuroscience and economics and you know, developmental psychology. I mean, now you look at almost any journal and you just go through the abstracts and the word well-being or positive emotions or gratitude, happiness is going to be in a, a major subset, really any article. So now, you know, or my field used to be called, and I guess it still is called positive psychology, and I don't like that term in part because um, we don't need we don't need a, a separate field anymore that's called positive psychology because positive psychology is now part of you know all the, all the other psychologies or social sciences. So um, yeah, it's really exciting. Like everyone's talking about it. And and the the term itself developed originally as a reaction to the focus of the, psych, the field of psychology on abnormality for years? Is that why Right, exactly. So Marty Seligman and Mike Csikszentmihalyi, um, they, they basically started the field of positive psychology back in 98, 99. Um, I was one of the, I was at sort of the conference where we kind of started talking about it, developed a manifesto, and the idea that it was a reaction to that most of the field of psychology was focusing on the negative, sort of <clears throat> a mental illness and disorder, pathology, stress, divorce, you know, trauma, which is, of course, really, really important, and it's still extremely important to continue studying, but the idea is that it's also important to focus on the positive side of life as well. Yeah, Freud kind of set a tone originally, didn't he? Yeah, Freud he? definitely set yeah. a tone. <laughs> so, so you've been at this for a while and seen an extraordinary amount of change. What's, what's one thing that you've experienced or seen occur within your field that you didn't expect? something that, that really kind of surprised you in the process of research or something else, someone else's research, your own research? Hmm, interesting. Well, um, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying your ad-libbing this interview. You're doing an amazing job. Oh, no, job. I prepared yeah. for at least five minutes yeah, prior yeah. to this program. So <laughs> last night, last yes, night. Yeah, yes. late, late last night. Over a lot of sake. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, these are great questions. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, it's funny. I'm often asked that question, like, what am I surprised at? And I often have, I often have trouble answering it because I feel well, like... Well, the reason it's a, always a great yeah. question, and this is a question you could throw at anybody and they think it's smart, but the reason is if you're talking to an expert, which usually you are in a case like this, something they didn't expect is something we should pay attention to. Right, right, right. Well, one thing I'm studying now, actually, I'm not really going to talk about it today in my main talk, but... Sometimes the pursuit of happiness, you know, can backfire. So actually, mm. I, I was just in Sydney. I just came back yesterday, so I'm really jet lagged. Um, but um, I gave a talk in Sydney about when the pursuit of happiness might backfire. And so, for example, when you try to be grateful or be kind to others or be optimistic or savor positive experiences, these are all, you know, commonly researched strategies um, to increase happiness. If you do it in the wrong way, if you do it too much or too little, 
uh, to the wrong person at the right time, um, you might actually become even le less happier than you started. So that's something that, it's not necessarily surprising, but I think it's sometimes counterintuitive um, and it's important to study as well. So for example, we find that if you try to count your blessings and you try too hard, you try to think of a lot of things you're grateful for and you can't, then you're gonna, it's gonna backfire and you're gonna decide. A somewhat, somewhat depressing exactly. revelation. <laughs> well, there, there's something called, actually it's one of my favorite heuristics, it's called the effort as information heuristic. And that's when you're trying hard to generate a list of something, then you're gonna judge the hard to generate items as less common. So the classic study, people were asked, think of six assertive behaviors that you have. I mean, you could all do this now, right? Think about six times that you have been assertive or think of 12 assertive behaviors that you have shown. How assertive are you? And people who try to think of 12 assertive behaviors, they think they're less assertive because they can't think of 12 things they've done. So think of you know 20 things you're grateful for. I can't think of 20 things, so I conclude I must not have that much in my life to be grateful for. So anyway, that's sort of a dosage effect. So um, I've been really interested lately in studying kind of the conditions under which the pursuit of happiness can actually undermine well-being. Is it, is it possible, uh, when we say pursuit of happiness, is it possible that the intentional pursuit itself makes it more elusive? Right, it, it is. Um, and so there's some research showing that if you are too preoccupied with the pursuit of happiness, that you know, you're going to be disappointed. It's actually one of those pursuits that like, if you feel like you haven't really measured up to your goal, then it's actually going to have a totally counteracting effect, right? You're gonna, it's, you're gonna be unhappy. And if you're monitoring your happiness too much, like it's like you keep asking yourself, am I happy yet, am I happy yet? How happy am I? Um, that in itself, of course, interferes with your enjoyment of life and your savoring, living in the moment. Um, and so it, it all, actually, this all seems almost obvious and kind of makes sense that you know you don't want to be too preoccupied with happiness or anything, really. Yeah. So I really believe, you know, getting back to Aristotle, sort of this, this idea that everything is good in moderation, yeah. except for whatever you did last night. Yeah, no, it would have been good in moderation, in fact. Um, uh, everything in moderation, nothing in excess. I think that, that someone said that before. So uh, let's ask the big question, what is happiness? So I like to define happiness, actually. There's lots of definitions, and actually at the Sydney conference, it was about the good life. Um, that I went to and we talked a lot about like how do we define happiness and should like meaning and engagement be part of happiness and we actually decided ultimately that there's a lot of things that kind of lead to happiness or are a consequence of happiness or are correlated with happiness but they shouldn't actually be in the definition so um, so for example something like social relationships right is something that's really important to happiness but it shouldn't be part of the definition of happiness so I define happiness the way that Ed Diener, who's kind of the founder of the science of well-being, defines it, which is that it has two components. And the first component is that you feel like your life is good, that you're generally satisfied with your life, that you're progressing towards your goals in a decent, adequate way. Um, that's one component. And the second component is that you fairly frequently experience positive emotions, whether it's joy, curiosity, or pride, or tranquility, calmness, uh, affection. Um, you experience those fairly frequently, not all the time, and you experience negative emotions fairly infrequently. Of course, negative emotions are really important in certain situations. You know, sometimes we need to be angry when we see injustice or we need to be anxious when something important is coming up we have to prepare for. Um, but when they're chronic, right, they're gonna be dysfunctional. So, so basically that's, that's the definition, sort of fairly frequent positive emotions and a sense that your life is a good life. So uh, I, I want to transition in a minute, but one, one last question for which you're completely unprepared, um, and you'll understand what I mean in a moment. Uh, you're in this extraordinary field that's been tra transforming in the past, uh, b born and transforming in the past couple of decades. Um, three words to describe the experience of being, uh, of studying happiness. Three words to describe the experience of studying happiness and hyphens are acceptable. Wow, wow, you just thought of that, didn't you? Yeah. Sure. Okay, all right, so one is, I guess, grateful, right? So it is such an incredible job that I have. It's like the best job in the world. So I'm just grateful to have this, this job, this career. Um, another is students or mentoring. So a big part of what I do 
is I train students. So I teach undergraduates and I train graduate students to become kind of the next generation of well-being researchers, and they are amazing, fantastic, and I love that part of my work, the mentoring. So gratitude, students or mentoring, and the third word. We can go with two if you like. It's not like a professor to not have yeah. something more to say. Yeah, I, I, yeah that's <laughs> right. I'm, I'm generally not at a loss for words. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll, actually, the third word I'll say what I think is the, maybe the most important thing to happiness, and that is connection. Great. So connecting with others, whether it's with my students, with my kids, uh, with colleagues. I really, I really the, more, the more I think about it, the more I think that connection, no matter how you call it, whether you talk about love or relationships or belonging, or social support, but connecting with others I think is key. I think, Sonia, that's one of the reasons that in this age of technology, we, the data are clear, there are actually a lot more convenings like this. Not just on happiness, but across fields uh, than there were 20 years ago. So it, it seems uh, maybe counterintuitive, but the more we digitize, the more we seek to connect. That's right, and we are still, in fact, at the Sydney conference, we had all these debates, there were all these talks about technology and well-being, and, and one, we're still social beings, you know, so yes, it's true, we, we spend so much of our times looking at our phones and missing out on life. There's this great cartoon about something, like someone, you go to heaven, and you're told, like, yeah, you had a great life, but you missed it because you were looking at your phone. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, but, but one, we're using that social media and that technology to connect. Right. And we're still social beings. We still, as you say, we want to come to this conference. We, we travel thousands of miles to come to these kinds of things. You know, we're, we want to fall in love. We want to be with other people, um, talk. And yeah, so we're still social beings. Well, Sonia, we're glad that you made the long trip to be with us. It sounds like life is good. Uh, I've certainly had a few positive emotions here in the discussion, and I'll also point out you, you talked about the, the backfiring when you seek, if you seek too intentionally perhaps happiness, uh, you might miss things because you're so intentional and focused. Nice to be focused, but over-focused, we miss serendipity. And in, in my group at Northwestern, we say never leave serendipity to chance. And you can do things to enhance the likelihood of positive serendipity, and I'd point out that had you not been open to serendipity, you wouldn't even be in this field today. Exactly. Because right. it it's completely serendipitous that I'm right. in this field today. Great. So Carl Jung referred to that as synchronicity. I think you've experienced it. Thank you very much. That was beautiful. Great. Great.